here with us. Uh, we're coming close to the end of the annual meeting. We have uh, one more meeting on Wednesday, and that will be uh, hearing from our visiting uh, speaker, our distinguished speaker, Kendall Moore. That should be very good. Am I still there? Yep. Okay, and uh, we'll, we'll hear from a lot of the uh, UNALS folks who came before us. I've lost the picture here. And today we're hearing from uh, some of the real heroes uh, in UNALS, and those are the uh, people on the, you know, chairing the standing committees and on the steering committees. Am I still on there, Doug? Yeah, you're, you're loud and clear. Okay. Good. <laughs> my, my computer tells me I'm disconnected here. So. Oh, no. It's, we can yeah. hear you loud and clear and see yeah, yeah. Okay, great. All right. So, uh, so I'm, my brain's a little confused now because I'm just looking at a logged off uh, computer. Anyway, so standing committees, you know, they're the heroes. It's where the rubber hits the road. You know, there's so much work down there. It's our deepest outreach to the communities that we are representing and reflecting in, in the, uh, you know, maintaining the uh, success and the health of the fleet. So great to have all of them here today, the chairs presenting, uh, you know, what, what's going on with their committee. So I'll just pass it off to them now. Doug. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so we have a, we'll just run down through all the committees. Um, I think you, you summed up well with the importance of all this. So we'll start with the safety committee and uh, Rear Admiral Jeff Garrett. Uh, give us an update of what they've been up to. Okay, thanks, Doug. This should be fairly, okay, great. Uh, I just have one slide with actual substance on it. Uh, if you want to go to that, Doug. Uh, our pro probably the safety committee's uh, main uh, work over the past year has been to update the research vessel safety standards and uh, come up with an 11th edition. So we've been through with a fine tooth comb the entire document, uh, streamlining some chapters of it, uh, plus updating terminology, references, outdated information, uh, type, typos, uh, better wording where appropriate, all those sorts of things. And we were able to include a backlog of small changes that had been accumulating for a while. And uh, hopefully since the last edition came out in 2015, uh, we felt it was time to perhaps do a new edition. So number 11 has been reviewed and approved by ARVOC. It's been reviewed and approved by the UNALS Council. And publication uh, and implementation of the book is uh, now in process. It'll still look very much like it, it's looked in the past uh, with the same basic framework of chapters. So it shouldn't be too much of a lift for people to find out, find in there what they need to find. Uh, as far as new work on the committee, uh, we've, we're currently working on a new, new Appendix A guidance for synthetic line. If you've noticed in that, and uh, some people have, that they, there is a reserved section in there for synthetic line uh, technical information, but there's, it, it just says reserved. There's no actual information there. And due to the fact that synthetic line is becoming, is seeing more usage in the fleet, uh, we felt it was time to get something in the book to allow people to uh, operate safety uh, safely and have safety standards for it. It's a pretty complicated project. Uh, uh, Rick Trask from Woods Hole is, uh, is kind of leading that effort and we're consulting with some industry folks and hope to have an approach and then develop actual information for uh, that will help the fleet with that in, in, the, in the future. And we've not received any waiver requests in the past year. So uh, that's, uh, as I say, most of our efforts have been directed toward the RVSS update and to uh, launching some new synthetic line guidance. So I wanna thank the, uh, we appreciate the UNALS Council uh, giving the RVSS update a review and approval. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to present today. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thanks Admiral, appreciate that. One, appreciate, we greatly appreciate all your leadership with leading the uh, committee and especially the RVSS update. Uh, you did the bulk of the work and we, all of us greatly appreciate that, especially given the complexities the operators and members of the committee have been dealing with in the last year. Uh, any questions for Admiral Garrett? 
Admiral, this is Dennis. What is the synthetic material made of? Uh, most, that's a tough question. Uh, most of the uh, guidance in Appendix A for lines and cables is for steel cable, uh, which of course is used for all sorts of things like mm -hmm. over the side, you know, over the over the side uh, operations. Uh, synthetics could be a variety of materials from, I think, from Kevlar to nylon or any other synthetic. And that, that again, is one of the things that makes this complex is having to deal with not just a single uh, type of material like you have with uh, steel wire. So I, I can't answer that in detail. Uh, I think that's something we're going to be grappling with, though, as we move, move forward on that project. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and I'll also just want to add that uh, regarding publication of the RVSS, we're, we'll focus on that after we get past the annual meeting here. We'll put it out in hard copy to all the operators so they have it on their shelf and for the texts and the ships and all that. And then we will also publish it online here shortly. So look for that coming probably uh, later this month. Um, I know everybody just waits with great anticipation to sit there and read the RVSS again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now, thanks again, Adam. We'll appreciate your uh, your update and, uh, and all your help with the safety committee. Great. I'm glad to be able to contribute. Next up is uh, the Mares committee. Uh, Emily Shimada from OSU is going to give us an update. Welcome, Emily. Thank you. Hi. Am I uh, audible? Can everyone hear me okay? Loud and clear. Yep. Fabulous. Oh, hold on. Hold on here. I do have one slide as well. Cool, full color. Thank you, Alice. Uh, my name is Emily Shimada. I'm a marine technician at Oregon State University. I'm the vice chair of MARIS. Uh, MARIS stands for Maintaining an Environment of Respect Aboard Ships. Uh, I'd like to start by just giving a quick read of our core values of our committee as they really inform uh, all of our recommendations and the activities that I'll report on today. Uh, the Maris Committee, we are dedicated to fostering a safe and supportive environment that values inclusion, respect, and accessibility. We value change and growth uh, and a diversity of views and backgrounds that offer each of us opportunities to understand, to learn, and to encounter new perspectives. Uh, who we are is on the left-hand side there. So uh, joining Mark, our chair extraordinaire, and the fantastic Craig Lee and myself this year are uh, our new members. And that's uh, Kay McMonagle, who is a postdoc from North Carolina State University, and Katie Smith, who's from the International Ocean Discovery Program at Texas A&M. Additionally, with those two members, our committee determined that there was a possibility to add representatives from other committees and that we would definitely value and uh, gain from their perspective. So we also have Hannah Delop, and Hannah is our committee representative from Ship Schedulers and she is at Scripps. So uh, in addition to having full committee representation, which made a big difference this year, uh, the things that we wanted to focus on and made some really nice headway were uh, developing a viewing guide for modules one and two for ship civility. The viewing guide is meant to be a sort of companion, both to assist in group viewings for science parties or for crew who are coming on board before a science mission begins, or to really uh, have sort of a, a guidance if someone's doing self-viewing uh, from home or another space. Uh, the companion, it is important in that it states the goals uh, of the videos themselves and the intents of the different intent excuse me, of the different modules, and also provides guided questions and some content warnings as well. So this was very carefully reviewed this year by all of our committee members. We got a final version out uh, and are accepting uh, feedback at this time. So hopefully that will get posted along with additional translations in other languages uh, for the videos. Again, just really to assist in people's ability to watch the videos on their own, especially if English isn't first language and to take the time and, and dedication to understanding kind of what's being covered there. So that's the viewing guide and the translations. 
the next topic, gender expression and name and use, this refers to work that was done uh, kind of at the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. So my big thanks to Alice and to Brandy and to Eric Grubel as well. This was a series of communications that developed in uh, identifying potential barriers that might exist in some of our online forms and what we could do potentially to kind of have a different separation of private versus public information, specifically looking at uh, instead of having a binary gender option of including a sort of more broad base and moving into pronouns instead and to have a public facing name in use that would be different from any sort of um, uh, legal name uh, that the individual might have. So that would now be considered confidential and a name and use would be uh, the name that that person prefers to go by. And that work was done on uh, the, uh, excuse me, the cruise planning website, which was great. So a lot of work was done and looked really fabulous. And we had a lot of really good feedback from that as well. Hoping to continue to see that as a a revolving, progressing uh, thing that we can do is looking at the various forms and other things that all of our institutions have and how can we be more inclusive in our language and remove potential barriers of people feeling comfortable and safe in joining in a cruise. Uh, the next one is pregnancy policies, not going away and certainly a good foundation uh, that our committee uh, is based on. The idea here again to provide kind of outward and easy accessible information from people who really, really want to go on a research cruise and maybe in a situation, uh, nursing or pre-pregnancy or uh, just found out they're pregnant, et cetera, uh, and would like to go on a cruise but aren't sure with the institution what a policy might be or who they should talk to. And so this is quite simply just having some publicly available information. Uh, had a really nice conversation back in August with marine superintendents. The idea here is uh, we are reachable at any time and kind of happy to look at any statements that institutions might have that you could borrow from or expand upon. And again, just having publicly facing information uh, about policies of pregnancy at sea and support for individuals who um, maybe it uh, impacts. Uh, the last one there, diversity and inclusion resources. So. Uh, in addition to what we're doing, kind of looking at uh, the various forms and everything else that we have in general, we're trying to build our own resource guides uh, related to having diversity and inclusion um, both specified and prioritized in meetings, uh, in groups, in developing codes of conduct, and all of these things that we might be thinking of. So a few of us have taken participation in a few workshops and together are kind of compiling these resources, had a pretty good run of it at RV Tech uh, this past month, um, which was great. Uh, just having a resource there and a space where people could talk about these topics and review them and have a dialogue and exchange about kind of their own core values and what they think is important to have an inclusive meeting. I think that's it for me. Um, happy to answer questions as well. Hopefully I didn't run over, but uh, our email is on the screen. So please feel free to email. That would go to all of those lovely individual names that you see there. I feel free to reach out to us individually as well, but that email will get all of us. Thanks, Emily. It was great. And you did great staying on time schedule. So thank you very much. Oh, Appreciate great. it. Uh, any questions for Emily in the uh, Maris committee? Well, I guess you get also dazzled with brilliance. Um, but thanks to all the work of the committee. I know you guys have had a lot of work to do this to now as you've transitioned to a standing committee this year and kind of like laid down your terms, you know, your terms of reference and your goals and your vision. I think uh, your team's doing a great job coming together um, and look forward to great things as we move ahead into the future here. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks so much. Okay, so next up, on our agenda is the Fleet Improvement Committee with Jim Swift, who's been, I think, the chair of FIC forever. No. <laughs> forever is coming to a close then. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> the uh, Fleet Improvement Committee has had very strong membership, and we're about to have some changes uh, in, uh, the, in light, in, in um, the light blue color on here, there's three members who are leaving the FIC. Uh, 
uh, uh, Rick, uh, Kyle, and Zoltan Kelly and myself. Uh, for, uh, Rick and I are both uh, hit our end of our two term limit. We have very strong new membership coming on, Steve DeHunt as an operator rep, and Kip Sherman has is already on the ground and running as the oncoming chair. Um, it's a, it's an, it's, we had a, a great candidates for both open positions. And then the, RB, um, the RVOC uh, ex officio member will either be Doug Baird or the, that committee's appointee. That's to be decided. Very strong membership. We've had the last meeting was in May. We're meeting again next week. We've had other, we've uh, continued to meet by over email discussions and also uh, had some membership discussions, which have been very positive. It's wonderful to have such strong candidates. Next slide, please. Maybe. I thought of perhaps the next slide just being uh, reporting that your fleet continues to improve, and that was it. <laughs> but, um, the biggest news in one sense, the science mission requirements for the next generation of the global class research ships are just down to the last tiny bits of editing that basically been approved and ready for the uh, ready to be posted. This will happen just as soon as the business ebbs enough to, for the office who has been very, very busy and very supportive to finish the last little bits. But we're, we're ready with those. And of course, as the RCRVs come along, we'll be involved. We already have, we have a member on, um, on the committee, the science, uh, um, I just caught the wrong thing, the science oversight committee, but you know what it is. Uh, I'm not sure whether we're going to need any further attention for the Revell and Atlantis refits. Uh, we might ask to take a look at the uh, first year or so of the, um, uh, come on you know, the, the, the post-cruise uh, reports. Assessment. Yeah, the post-cruise assessments. Um, and then the other business is, is, is con continues, I guess is the easiest way to say, it. but let's go to the, the next slide, which is the last slide. And we've had a conversation with Kip and I took the liberty of taking some of what he has expressed interest in pursuing, that he'll be discussing this with the committee. So none of this is, is set in stone. But I think that what we're going to see in the next uh, year or two is going to be continued attention to the, uh, what I call the socialization of the acquisition of the next generation of global class research vessels. This is sort of a eight to 10 year process perhaps, but we have to get everything ready in the community and the agencies and in Congress uh, to do something like this. It takes a while. Um, a, a very important aspect is, is anything the FIC can do to help prepare the next generation of observational oceanographers. Um, uh, this is re recognizing that training on the academic research fleet ships is the ideal platform also for promoting the environment of respect and outreach to groups. And um, I think you're going to find some interesting um, uh, proposals coming, coming out or being supported by the Fleet Improvement Committee in that regard. And there's an ongoing interest in the committee to, uh, to attention to what the Fleet Improvement Committee can do to help the situation along for the smaller boats and coastal research vessels. Certainly, um, you know, they provide a platform for where a lot of us have all been trained. And so, they, I mean, they're important. They're important to the fleet, and uh, what attention will be provided there, and also anything the fleet improvement committee can do to help along the new Scripps acquisition. And then there's the issue of how to improve the continued efforts to improve efficiency and cost effectiveness, effectiveness of the existing fleet and new ships. And uh, I, I think this is where the the, the the fic is headed right now. As the RCRBs come along, I mean, that that's being looked at that's being looked at for very well by the existing committees, but the FIC always has an ongoing interest in the big picture with those ships and will follow through. So any questions? Thanks, Jim. Appreciate that. Uh, anybody got any good questions for Jim in the, or the uh, Fleet Improvement Committee at this time? No question, Jim, but thank you for your service for so many years. Oh. Great job. 
Thank you. It's been an honor to uh, be on the FIC. Uh, a little bit of a slow start, but we got a nice, we got rolling along and Claire left things in some superb condition. And I think we've left things in good condition for Kip. So. All right. And welcome aboard, Kip. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, we're just rolling right along today with all these, because uh, we know we're in good, in good hands with all these uh, committee chairs and these updates. So next up is the uh, Deep Submergence Committee with Anna Louise from Portland. I think from Portland, I don't know <laughs> where she is today. Well, I'm in yeah, a little town called Mosier, but yeah, near Hood River. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think I'm not going to be as quick, unfortunately, but um, so um, but I'll, I'll try and push it through quickly. Uh, I um, I'm going to do my normal. I just tell you a little bit about. Um, uh, about the membership and a little bit of a, updates about the NDSF vehicles. But I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the COVID impacts that have, have come on the operators and the users. Um, and, and to sort of fold into that a little bit, um, I thought I'd, I reached out, or we reached out to um, other national deep submergent vehicle operators to see what they what their experiences were this over the past year. So I've got some more sort of um, in depth um, sort of looks at how we've all been impacted. And then I'll end um, with you know, some of the other activities our meeting uh, our committee has been involved in. Next slide, please. So our membership has um, not really changed this year, which is awesome, except that we did get um, Amy Baker-Taylor to join us as part of the UNOS committee rep. That's what I call it. I'm not sure that's the name. Um, and then the other big deal is that um, Anna Michelle um, is now the chief scientist for deep submergence at HUI. Um, and so we've been working closely with her on a lot of issues. Um, and I've just left Adam Sewell. She replaced Adam Sewell. Um, I've left him in there. Um, he's actually not at HUI anymore, um, but at URI. I see that's a mistake. Um, and then I'm basically um, cycling off. So if anybody um, wants to become chair of desk, please get their name in the hat. There's a, um, there's a call out um, for, uh, uh, for, chief, uh, for the chair. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I'm not actually gonna say much about Alvin. Um, Adam gave a very good um, update on Alvin 6500. Um, I uh, encourage you all uh, to go listen to his talk if you weren't there, um, but I also re recommend going to the website. The HUI website has a lot of detailed information. Um, currently they're doing their verification expedition. Um, well, no, the certification expedition um, and uh, the last I heard, and, and Tumi can perhaps min, uh, update me a little bit, but I know that they had um, a problem with the USB, um, the, the, the pole. So, uh, uh, so that's, that's where we are with that. Um, and, and the actual cruise itself is going out um, in, the actual science verification cruise is going out in, in shortly, um, uh, about two weeks or so. And I, I encourage you all to, um, again, follow the website for that. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So um, Jason, um, I've already, uh, in, in May, I sort of went over um, the three cruises that had been completed, but Jason has, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, Jason has spent much of the summer um, in the ocean observatories um, uh, uh, expeditions out here on the west coast. Um, and then um, I think I'm going to put my face here. I'm, I'm, you know, we're also Zoom tolerant, but I'm still not so good at it sometimes. <laughs> it's just weird. Um, anyway, all right, there I can see myself and I can see Doug. Um, not alone. It's okay. <laughs> okay, now I can talk to you. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing. You know, we've been doing this for so long and then suddenly you get one day where it's like, I'm just talking to myself. Um, anyway. 
Um, so anyway, Jason's been spending, spent mo much of the summer out on the West Coast. During that time, many of you probably realize and or have seen it, um, but the OAT, Hercules and Argus actually um, broke their tether and we were at about 2,200 meters at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and luckily, luckily, Jason was close by. And so I think it was a half a day steam or something and um, they went to the rescue and it was apparently quite a challenging recovery, um, but a fun, you know, fun. They were able to recover both the Hercules and Argus and, um, and uh, yeah, so that worked out really well. After that, they went back, uh, Jason went back to uh, Hui and um, uh, a lot of that extra time then was used for upgrades um, uh, and just basic maintenance. And I, they're listed here in this. Um, and right now they're on their way to Guaymas or maybe they're, yeah, they're about to leave for Guaymas um, and with Century um, on an expedition with Anna Michelle. Um, moving forward, um, there are a lot of challenges in, a, you know, in the NDSF group um, and especially Jason because it's, the schedule is pretty heavy. And there are over 200 dive scheduled. And so the one thing that um, the operators are really working on is trying to um, add new employees and contractors um, to really um, facilitate the challenging schedule ahead. Century, on the other hand, um, has been um, spent a lot of the time in Woods Hole this summer, do, again, taking advantage of sort of COVID downtime and upgrading and basic maintenance. Um, they integrated a few sensors, including the methane sensor that they're use, going to be using now and testing in the Guaymas. Um, and then after that, they did a expedition um, which had been delayed because of COVID with uh, Joe Reesing. It turned out to be about a 50-day um, ex uh, expedition. Um, but I just list some of the things that Sean Kelly provided um, which is that it was a highly successful cruise. And so um, they got a lot of data, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, photographs, et cetera. And so they were very, very happy after that. And right, as I said, now they're off to Guaymas um, with Jason. Um, but the one thing that all of these, um, that, that you don't see about all, with all these successes is that there have been, with each one of these people, with each one of these um, vehicles, next slide please, there's been a big impact in many different ways um, uh, through the whole COVID issue. And I think we all know this, but I wanna say it again, um, you know, that the, the operators um, have pushed forward really hard to make this happen. They, and there's been some amazing good cruises um, and great successes, but it's added a huge amount of stress and additional burden on a lot of the um, operators, but, but also the users. Um, I was just talking to Anna, you know, and she needed all the COVID tests, all the certification of COVID tests, um, just a lot of added levels. Um, and so actually it was sort of sweet, but um, one of the things, um, that Sean Kelly mentioned was, you know, that it was almost a reprieve to be able to be in Woods Hole with more people now vaccinated. And so they can actually have a, a bit of a break from just this continual stress of, um, uh, overlying stress of, of COVID. Um, so just, we should, I think we should just all be very um, cognitive of that it's so extremely challenging for most of the chief, chief scientists and the operators um, to do a lot of these um, expeditions. And, um, and it has impacted uh, people's lives pretty significantly. And hopefully this is gonna change slowly, but it is slowly changing. Um, so, so because of that, I, I, we approached um, some of the other operators to just see how they, how they were impacted. Next slide. And so I spoke to um, Bruce Howe um, of the Lulukai, um, and you know, he, he was clear that uh, for, for, his, for their team, the quarantines really added this whole additional um, layer of time at sea, 
um, time of isolation, um, and it it even resulted in a delayed departure of one of the um, uh, expeditions. Nonetheless, and this is what's so amazing um, in these times, is that nonetheless they were able to use the time um, at, at uh, you know, um, on 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 land to upgrade the system. So they've got numerous upgrades. I just mentioned two here, but one of them is pretty important and that's um, uh, installing a universal power supply so they don't have to deal with dirty power and, and such from the ship. Um, and they, in addition, they were able to get three expeditions done in, in this time frame. Um, and so they're pretty excited about that. And that little video is amazing to watch. So I, I, um, I, I encourage you to, that's mostly uh, associated with the cabled observatory maintenance um, video. Um, anyway, so they, you know, they still, he, he, he definitely shared the concern that there's been quite a lot of impact on uh, because of COVID stress and, and fatigue. Um, next slide. Notwithstanding, or despite all the ongoing um, COVID challenges, um, the folks at uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute and um, using um, Sebastian um, have had a very successful time. Um, and I kind of wanted to highlight a few things here because I think this is important to notice. They, they were all over the world. They were down in Australia. Um, and so they, were ma they managed to just keep the ship going through this time. Um, what's, what's coming up, which I think is very exciting, is that they, um, there's a new sh support ship coming online, um, the Falco 2. It's, I think it's um, been built in Spain. <clears throat> and uh, Sebastian and, and the new Falco will go into sea trials um, late in 2022. And so for the next year, primarily, Sebastian will actually be uh, doing a lot of modifications to be able to integrate with Sebastian. So they're going to be um, probably up in Seattle or somewhere, wherever they base themselves. Yeah. The other thing I thought was interesting for us as a group, as, as UNOL's group, is that um, SOI actually were at um, COP26 this year at the climate conference. And um, they presented a new little film um, that basically used footage from Sebastian and the Falcor expeditions. And the film's called Climate Under Pressure. Um, so I think it's something for us to look out for, but I think that's uh, it's a good um, advert for our field, but also for, for, for our oceans. Um, so I, I encourage you to try and find that little, that movie. And then finally, the other group that I actually reached out to was um, uh, OET and, um, you know, Nautilus and Hercules. And um, Alison wrote me and said, just please tell you Knowles. Thank you, thank you, thank you to NSF and you Knowles and UDAB and Hui for all the support and assistance with our ROV company. And I could hear the, the relief in her email. Um, so that was really a, a good um, uh, demonstration of great collaborations between, um, between many institutions um, and that we got it back was amazing. Um, they have been, you know, same thing, have the same kinds of issues with um, the added stress of COVID, but have been continued have to have very successful cruises um, and mostly um, on the, uh, in the Hawaiian islands and the national monument areas. And she also would like me to mention that they will be advertising for a new position for chief scientist at OET. So get that word out. And then next slide. And so finally, um, so, you know, uh, what I'd like to just end with is just a few other little things that DESC has been busy with. We haven't been hugely busy this last half year, um, but we have been involved with getting the science verification expedition up and running. And I just got off from before this meeting with um, a bunch of the microbiologists that are going out to see. Um, so we've been planning that, that expedition. And I think it's going to be um, very interesting to see what comes out of that. Um, 
We've also um, finally finalized um, a, a timeline for the imagery user work skills workshop. And I mentioned this previously um, at one of our uh, previous meetings and it's gonna be in late January of 2022. And uh, it, essentially these are gonna be two days um, of um, teaching new users and old users the basics and fundamentals of capturing one of the most important pieces of data that we capture um, when we are down at the bottom of the ocean, and that is high quality video and underwater stills. And um, this will involve not only um, Evan Kovacs, but we'll have a bunch of artists and different kinds of users um, share their, their opinions and approaches. And there'll be um, breakout groups and there'll be panels. So it'll be kind of a fun interactive um, kind of online workshop. We just heard that Ocean Sciences is going to go online. So it's not gonna be um, a combined meeting. And so our desk annual meeting, which we've decided to oscillate between AGU and Ocean Sciences, uh, and this was gonna be Ocean Sciences, um, our annual meeting will now um, be online, um, unfortunately, I guess. Um, and we're also planning a new user meeting and that's going to be online. We, we did not, uh, previously we did not have a new use, um, user meeting because um, online, because we thought it was very important for networking, but the feedback from new users was, please do an online workshop. So we're going to do that. Um, additionally, we've had some discussion on how to foster more EI participation in our committee. And uh, one idea is that we're gonna perhaps add a graduate student postdoc intern type membership into the committee so we can train um, uh, up and coming scientists. Um, and this is, this is just an ongoing discussion, but I thought I'd add it there because I had a little bit of a discussion with Dennis about this. And a few other ongoing activities where um, uh, working on uh, recommendations on whether to include century sites and data processing in NDS activities. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Well, thanks for that comprehensive update, Anna Louise. There's been a lot going on. Uh, appreciate you putting all that together. Uh, questions for Anna Louise? Hey, Anna Louise, let me just say real quick, you know, it's it's going to be hard to fill your shoes. You know, I mean, the report you just gave it demonstrates how healthy the the assets are, and it's you know under your leadership and your committee's leadership that so important for that. And you know, the deep submergence committee, you know, our, our community really owes you a lot, and we owe you a lot. And so, thank you for that. And it's got, again, it's going to be hard to fill your shoes, though. So, uh, well, good I luck said, with that. I said the same with. Uh, when Pete stepped, when I moved into Pete's shoes, and they were very hard shoes to fit Pete Gerges's shoes, so they were very hard shoes to step into. But you know, it's it's been really challenging um, for both Alice and me because of COVID. You know, it's just it's it really keeping the community vital and excited and on on target and not you know Zoom fatigued and etc. Uh, anyway, there is a question oh. from Ryan Midson. Not a question, but I just want to, you know, express my heartfelt thanks as well. I don't want to delay the meeting, but uh, I appreciate you enormously. And uh, don't don't overplay uh, uh, the challenges. We need to we need to recruit somebody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I know it's very easy to do this job. <laughs> but well, you know what? I have to say, it's a lot of fun, and I feel honored to be part of it. I really do. And I, I and actually, I love. I love the big UNOLS meetings too. I mean, I get very excited about hearing, you know, the extent of, of the national assets. Uh, I mean, it's something you don't get an opportunity to do really when you're, you know, just a basic scientist focusing on your own research. So for me, it's been really, um, yeah, it's been eye-opening and very enjoyable. And I've well, we're going to use you for marketing for all our, Committee, committee <laughs> chairs, committee membership, because we love your energy and passion. Well, Absolutely. You know, I, think I think it's the interdisciplinary part, you know. It's I'm I'm sort of a 
I loved hearing, you know, I've learned so much about engineering too, you know, and the insides <laughs> of ships and <laughs> stuff like that. Anyway, all right. Well, thank you. I don't want to keep you any longer. Thanks. Thank Thanks you, so Andrew. much. Next thank up you. is uh, John Orcutt for the Marine Seismic Research Operators Committee or MISROC, as I like to call it. Uh, I call it MS Rock, but if you notice the first slide, I made an error. It's the, actually the Marine Seismology Research Oversight Committee. Uh, if I can have the next slide. Uh, this is a list of the members of the, uh, of the committee. Uh, most of them are nearing the, uh, the uh, term in, in office, and we will need to uh, replace a few people this uh, uh, not distant future, uh, although others will stay on. Uh, next year, my uh, first term uh, ends, and we'll need to look uh, at that as well to see, uh, look at changes. So the next slide. This is more fun. I, uh, one of the problems that I have uh, had, I think, and it's extended back earlier even, is that the the attendance at meetings has been rather uh, poor. So I did communicate with the committee uh, in October uh, and suggested a change in how we would actually work in the future. And that largely boils down to um, actually hosting at least two lectures every year. And one of those would be at the fall meeting. But I would expect, uh, in fact, that this will run into four to five uh, every year. And it gives uh, members and scientists an opportunity to uh, propose uh, unusual ideas uh, for the future or complaints about issues that have uh, that have arisen um, at sea. Um, the current and previous members of MS Rock will form a, pl a planning committee. That is, once you've been in MS Rock for a period of time, you're welcome to participate in the uh, in the uh, planning for the uh, during the year meetings and the lectures that would be available then. And uh, uh, that pretty much sums up that page uh, and where we're going. So the next. Uh, Next slide, please. Um, subjects uh, that we might uh, look at. The big ones that has been a problem for some time is uh, seismic nodes, uh, small um, ocean bottom seismographs uh, that could be deployed during multi-channel uh, experiments. We're using instruments now that are, that are almost, well, probably more than two decades old and they're large and clumsy. Um, it is possible to put the same capabilities and more in a much smaller package, uh, at much less expense and much more reliability. Um, Real-time telemetry, we've experimented a lot with this. It's been quite successful, uh, but it's the issue of bringing C4 uh, data acoustically to a, a glider and then to space and then to the laboratory and the data archives uh, here. The idea of a, a global seismic network uh, uh, came to mind and small arrays of broadband OBSs uh, are currently being used um, a lot using broadband, very sensitive uh, seismic sensors uh, to bring data back or record data on the um, the C4. In fact, yesterday, uh, a group uh, left uh, with a kilo Moana from Oahu to uh, deploy another small array um, offshore. Um, uh, and, and several people were bored, but it uh, it's uh, it went well and uh, had no real hiccups at all in getting stuff on board, including people. Um, but uh, it's uh, a thing that currently is um, under great demand. Uh, and a lot of this work is going on throughout the year. Uh, instrument calibration is an issue uh, that could be discussed. Uh, size, uh, seismometer burial is another. And 
most importantly, not maybe most importantly, but very important is uh, the idea of autonomous ships. So if we could have the next slide. This is uh, probably people have seen this, but this is the uh, so-called Sproul replacement. Um, the idea um, is to replace uh, uh, the diesels with uh, hydrogen uh, systems. So it's an, an essentially a, a, an electric um, uh, powered approach to this. It's possible along the entire West Coast to load uh, hydrogen on the uh, on the ship uh, at most of the larger cities that the range of this particular system is about 2,500 miles. But the high density is a, is a big, big deal here. It has been funded by this, uh, the state of California and you see a little Gloston uh, logo on the, uh, uh, on the sea beside the ship. And we also spent a lot of time working with Sandia on the use of hydrogen and electric uh, propulsion. Um, and there's a report that's been written on that. So if we go to the next slide, this is an idea of a, an autonomous uh, launch uh, and recovery vessel. Uh, some of you have probably seen this. And actually, if you could just click the, uh, uh, the thing about, there you go, this, there's a small lower Earth orbit satellite antenna. Next time, next one. That's a gantry that moves back and forth uh, that can uh, run all the way back to the stern and up to the moon pool for uh, putting instruments in the water. Then I click it again. Uh, that's a recovery basket uh, that goes through the moon pool for recovering instruments here and one more here. This is a, this a ship is about 100 and 30 feet long, and it uh, would carry um, 432 of these broadband OBSs uh, to see, or other things. You could think of all sorts of things that you might want to be able to launch um, from sea and engineer the uh, necessary interfaces to allow that kind of deployment. Uh, the idea the, we believe that it's possible to recover instruments, including gliders. Um, actually, glider um, retrieval has already been done by the Navy um, uh, to, to recover gliders. Um, but we believe that a lot of instruments could be both launched and recovered from a system like this. So I, the Fleet Improvement Committee, uh, it's, it's something we should talk about, I think, about whether this is a, a, a feature of the future, or uh, and I believe that it is. It's just very, very expensive now to uh, for something like large deployments of seafloor instruments. It's very expensive to use a manned ship uh, when an autonomous ship may well work. So the next slide. One of the things that the Ocean Studies Board did um, uh, a year ago was, uh, was to devise a program they called Ocean Shots and that comes after Moonshot. Uh, Moonshot used to be a big deal, still is really, but uh, it was everybody sat around the television watching uh, these things be launched and uh, come back to, to land eventually. So they named this uh, rather than Moonshot called it Ocean Shots, and it was part of the UN Ocean uh, Decades Actions uh, Committee. There is a meeting next week on the 12th of November um, at uh, 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, where the Ocean Studies Board, or in fact, the, uh, the Decadal Actions Committee is going to be meeting with OSTP to discuss the funding of the uh, ocean charts ideas. And you see many of these on this slide, it's called the uh, transparent ocean. Uh, if you look closer, all that may be very hard. You'll find there's a lot of uh, acoustics and uh, seismic uh, systems that are um, called out in that slide. And 
as well as autonomous vehicles. The sail drone, for example, on the lower right side bubble here is, uh, is an example of this. And I, I took this, it's just a screenshot. You see Larry Mayer, who's the chair of this, the system giving this talk um, a few days ago. But if you, I would recommend that if you take the time, go to the Ocean Studies Board um, website, uh, dig around a little bit, and you can find a place for invitations to this that will allow you to, uh, like this meeting, at least uh, log in and uh, watch the presentation. I don't think they'll be taking questions, but it might be an interesting day to, uh, to see what's going on with this Ocean Shots idea. I believe that's the end of the material I have and be happy to answer questions. If any. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Uh, questions for John. Some interesting things to chew on there for us to think about looking forward uh, from here. John, this is uh, Dennis. Uh, that uh, autonomous vessel, is it mostly on the uh, west coast of the United States with that those OBSs are deployed, would you need one vessel or, or, or do you work off the East Coast? I don't know what the uh, spatial distribution of those deployments uh, well, are. Well, it, 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 you know, like the ocean is global. Uh, one of the big problems that we have in the seismology, particularly the structure the, of the whole earth is that uh, two thirds of the planet is covered by oceans. Uh, one third is, uh, available to walk about and put in seismic stations and so around around the planet. But it leaves all that uh, information and we the needed information from uh, various events to really understand the planet as a whole and the interior structure as well as convection uh, changes and, uh, and so on. And societal issues like tsunamis, which are readily detected by C4 seismographs. <laughs> and earthquakes and so on. Any other questions for John? Let me, let me just follow up. So how many boats are you talking about then? I mean, is that- How many of these? Yeah, how many does it take to, to do the job or what's, what's the- difference? Well, I, th I think if you had two ships like this, uh, you, could, um, you could cover most of the planet. Um, the deployments are pretty straightforward. Um, having a ship in the Pacific, having a ship in the Atlantic, um, and then both of them covering parts of the Indian Ocean and the Arctic now, which is which is uh, a lot of possibilities in the Arctic these days because of the uh, reduction in ice that's available. It's pretty much unexplored um, uh, in terms of the of the seismology in the interior of the Earth. All righty. Well, thanks, John. Appreciate it. I was, um, like I said, it gives us plenty to think about and talk about. It'll be a good conversation to have with the FIC. Uh, next up is our new RVOC chair, uh, Doug Baird, giving us an update on what the Marine superintendents in that community are doing. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning to those in Hawaii. Um, if, if I cut out, I'll try and dial in. My connection has been kind of pretty spotty all day. Um, so I'll make it quick. As was noted earlier, Zoltan Kaledi uh, has moved on to his new assignment uh, as of Wednesday, five days ago. And uh, so I have been chair of VOC for five days. Um, and good luck to Zoltan in building his new ship. Uh, so some of the things we're working on is vessel crewing, uh, as uh, suggested by Rose DeFore at NSF, was to get a Tiger team together to explore options in how to solve the problem of keeping our crews fully staffed. Uh, it's been a problem throughout uh, not only the academic research fleet, but across industry as well. The, the number of mariners willing to go to sea for weeks on end is gradually reducing. Um, so we've got to figure out uh, new ways to, to get crew to make sure the research, uh, SC, uh, research operations continue. We've been meeting uh, about every uh, month and a half to two months with all the marine superintendents uh, to discuss uh, vessel operations, uh, medical protocols and lessons learned. And uh, we've basically helped each other out throughout this whole year and a half pandemic 
to keep things going. And Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe only two cruises have failed to proceed because of uh, pandemic reasons. So of the, right. uh, so it's it's been working. It's been a challenge, but uh, all in all, we've been uh, going to sea and getting the research conducted and doing it effectively and, and safely. So that's all I've got. Um, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for stepping into the breach. Um, and thanks to the leadership result and provided as the RVOC chair uh, the last couple, last three years. Um, um, we've talked a lot about the meetings and updates previous, so it's I think it kind of stands on its own what the, the Marine Superintendent community has been busy doing, doing a great job of it too. Any questions for Doug? Just wanted to shout out. Thank you, Doug, for stepping up. Such an important position. Certainly. Sure to do it. And we'll be recruiting for a new RVOC chair elect, by the way. So I always have one ready to go next. <laughs> okay, uh, not seeing any other questions. We'll continue on. Next up is Sam Lady, chair of the Arctic Icebreaker Coordinating Committee. Hey, folks. Um, I'll just give an oral report. Um, I know some of you. <laughs> The, the duties of the AICC change uh, continually. We have very broad uh, duties and the, the Arctic world is changing underneath us. So we're, we're very adaptable committee. Um, just to give people an idea who may not be familiar about our mechanics of the committee, uh, we have broad responsibilities to coordinate um, any US researchers on US Arctic icebreakers, but that is not only our limit. We also try to provide advice for any US Arctic scientists who might be working on foreign icebreakers, and also U.S. scientists who might not be working on icebreakers per se, but might be in the United States, Alaskan Arctic. So our, our expertise sort of diffuses into a, uh, things that aren't technically in our name, but what we can contribute to. Um, in terms of the ships that we pay attention to, there are two primarily, so the Coast Guard Cutter Healy and the uh, UAF vessel RV Skuliak. Um, we, we focus on almost all Healy operations and only the Sekuliak operations that involve work in the ice. Um, one of the reasons that we do that is because um, there, there are only two national assets. So that's, that's what our focus is in keeping um, United States academic uh, research scientists well-equipped as much as possible with advice and uh, guidance for where, when they work in the Arctic. Um, our membership is very broad for that reason. So we have eight elected members from the US research community. Um, we have three ex officio members from other UNOLS committees, uh, one representative from the Sekuliak Ship Science Committee. So the University of Alaska provides an ex officio member. Uh, program managers from all the agencies that use the ship. So not just NSF, but ONR, NOAA, sometimes others. Um, agency representatives from other United States and also foreign Arctic focused government agencies. So we have Canadian informal reps on our committee as well as uh, uh, other United States agencies focused on Arctic policy and science. Uh, regional stakeholders are on our committees too. We've grown in the past couple of years, maybe three years to absorb um, representatives from uh, different local communities along the Alaskan uh, Arctic coast and the, and the Bering Strait communities and also the new tribal representative for District 19 Coast Guard. Um, and we also have the ship representatives. So uh, representatives from Sekuliak, we're very lucky to have on our committee as our ex officio members, um, uh, Ethan Roth and, 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 and uh, Doug Baird. So these are the people who are actually, uh, you know, instrumental to Sekuliak or sort of looped back in our committee through the, through the ex officio pathway. And uh, Healy ship representation is fairly broad too. So we have um, officers on uh, membership of the committee, not membership of the committee, but at our meetings, um, the start group, the, uh, the technology uh, C5IT group uh, from base Seattle and, and also uh, up until very recently, the science liaison. Um, so our, 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 our normal duties involve um, pretty much focusing on upcoming cruises. Uh, so this is our, I don't want to say our dead time of the year, but this is when the cruises have gone out in the fall. We start gearing up for our winter meeting, which is happening in January 20th, 21st this year. Um, that's where most of our duties go. But that being said, uh, we did have a meeting this year in June, our annual summer meeting. 
Uh, we tried some new things this year. Um, like I said, we have a lot of different people participating, so it's difficult to squeeze them in all in one meeting. Uh, in the summer meeting, we tried bringing in the ex officio members to actually give presentations and reports. Uh, that hasn't been part of our meetings until this year, and we thought we'd try it out because they're valuable and we want to hear what other committees are doing. So we're trying to build those linkages within the committee. Um, we also had a report this summer by one of our new members. So we got two new members earlier this year. Uh, um, we had gender parity in joining the committee last year, and we also had a diversity in um, experience. So we had a very new person, uh, a, a junior scientist, Emily Item uh, from UNC Wilmington, and we tasked her, as she volunteered, but we asked her to give us sort of a junior scientist perspective on how from her point of view, what are the barriers for using these types of resources, using the Healy or using the Sekuliak? And she did a very good job by reaching out to some of her own colleagues and getting information and collating it and asking questions. And so she gave us a really good presentation on what it looks like from the junior people's point of view. And that's not a perspective we often ask for, and we should, um, but it stimulated some real interest in having a sort of a chief scientist for Healy or Sekuliak training crew. So how do you work in the Arctic if you don't have all this knowledge built over time? Um, and that's something we'd like to go forward with. So I know other groups within UNILS have had great success with it. Uh, we, want, we, want, we want to learn from you and, and try these this year. So that's, that's an initiative we're following. Um, we also did some work uh, earlier this year on just reviewing some of the technology and the instrumentation on Healy. Um, so there's a midlife refit extension opportunity coming up in the next few years. Uh, we're trying to stay ahead of that. So working with Frank Rack at NSF to make sure that he gets the right information and guidance he needs to specify uh, purchases for, let's say, the acoustic systems on the Healy. Um, we also had a lot of interest this past year on uh, unmanned autonomous systems in the Arctic. So, you know, there's a there's a committee for this on UNOLs, but the situation in the Arctic is very different than a lot of other places. And this was more of an opportunity to educate our members about why it's just not, I don't want to call it simple, but it's it is a lot more going on with flying unmanned vehicles, uh, unattended vehicles in the Arctic. And it, it was good to have the scientific community reminded of some of these things. Um, flight situation is very different. Uh, oversight of the airspace is very different. There's a lot of territory coming together in the Arctic. And it was just good to get to clear the air with some of that. Um, we are really looking forward to the, the Marine Planner um, system. And we're, we're, we, love to, uh, we love hearing how this is coming along. It's going to help us immensely with keeping an eye on Sekuliak issues because we're not interested in all the cruises, only the little tiny slice that has to do with being in the ice and how that works. So this will help us minimize sort of reporting requests to the, the science crews because we don't, don't need a report from everything. We're just kind of curious how the, how the um, ice breaking and ice in ice operations work. And this will, I think this will really help them. So thanks for putting that together. This is going to solve a problem we've had for several years. Um, I've mentioned this before, uh, and we've just heard a lot about it. It's a big turnover year for um, AICC, uh, you know, with uh, recurring three-year memberships and an eight-person elected membership. This doesn't add up to any mathematical continuity at all. Uh, we were looking to lose four people this year, but we worked with Dennis on sort of uh, getting sort of the okay to, to realign our membership and our onboarding and offboarding. So we've extended two members to stay an additional year just to stabilize things, which means we needed two members this year. It's technically three because Jim is leaving us, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, so we did get one new member. We have Chris Cox, uh, Dr. Chris Cox from NOAA. Uh, it's great for him to join us because he will be bringing along some meteorological expertise, Arctic meteorology. And one of the members that we're losing this year Ola Parison is a meteorologist. And so we like to keep this disciplinary balance. And so it's really great that he's he, he applied um, and, and that you approved him. So thank you. Um, we're still short a member. Uh, if you've noticed, uh, we, have, we have a call out. Y if you have any colleagues that you know, um, uh, please, please uh, encourage them to join. Um, one of the other things is that we're losing the chair this year. I will be stepping away. Um, and uh, we did mention in our in our call for new members that former AICC members 
as long as you've missed a term uh, or been away for a term, you're eligible again. And I know that there are two chairs on the uh, on on this phone call, two former chairs. So just dropping the hint, Jim, uh, uh, Lisa, if you're interested in serving again, we could use your leadership. Jim, I know you're stepping down from FIC. Here's an opportunity. Uh, some of you don't know that Jim was actually the first AICC chair uh, 20 years ago. That's a so great he can, idea. He can, he can close the loop. I, I <laughs> would right. be happy. Yep. So, so let me just wind up with just a little bit of what's been going on. So that was sort of the architecture, and, and we've been having some administrative stuff that we were able to do this summer. But, you know, our main focus is on helping coordinate uh, people's use of the ships. Um, so some of you might remember that last year there was a fire on Healy, one of the engines, and the ship was down all winter. Coast Guard worked really hard. They got it up and running this, this early winter, early this year, uh, and they were able to complete uh, kind of a unique field season. They, uh, the ship was used continuously by the Coast Guard this summer to complete sort of the first ever Northwest Passage trip. And while they got from, you know, Alaska to Baffin Bay, there was another field exercise, a, a scientific um, field program in Baffin Bay. So this was primarily a Coast Guard operational um, cruise, Coast Guard cruise of opportunity, let's call it, but they were very good about uh, offering space to scientists and working around um, their own sort of operational coordination needs with, the Canadian Navy and the Coast Guard and so forth to, to allow science to get done. And we, we were really happy to hear that because it might be that this is the way things are kind of going in the Arctic in the future. Um, you know, being able to leverage opportunities on cruises that might have different missions. Um, and so that was really great. Um, that's also what we're sort of anticipating for 2022. Uh, again, a Coast Guard Northwest Passage cruise. Uh, we're not clear about that yet. Um, one of the interesting challenges this year is that we've lost uh, a very important person in the whole United States icebreaker coordinating community. So Dave Forcucci, I think that came across wrong. Dave retired. <laughs> we didn't lose Dave. He just, he's doing something else. So, so I just realized that as I'm saying, Dave's retired. So what he was is our sort of civilian liaison at base Seattle, he was sort of the interface between the Coast Guard culture and the academic culture. And it's not clear what is gonna happen then. It's not clear if there's gonna be another civilian in this position, or if we are going to start working directly with uh, Officer Corps, um, it's not clear. So this is an interesting time for AICC. We, we basically have to retool our network. Um, but this, this offers some opportunities. Um, Dave worked hard for 20 years. We're very, we're very, you know, thankful for his, for his, for his service. Um, but it does, it does offer us some interesting challenges to build new connections with, with maybe different parts of the Coast Guard who we don't often get to talk to. Um, so that's pretty much all I have for this meeting. Um, but like I said, we have our next meeting in January. Uh, if you're interested, visit the UNOLS website. You're more than welcome to join us. We'd be happy to have you there. So can I take some questions? Yeah, Sam, I have a question. Yes, I'm yeah. David Smith. Hey, um, my understanding is that the Falcor 2, the replacement for the Falcor, will have some ice rating. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, is this, uh, have you been in discussion with the Schmidt Ocean Institute about this? I have not, but I'd be very happy to. We're, like I was just mentioning, we, uh, the world in the Arctic is changing a lot. Mm. And ships that are even marginally capable of working in the ice can be put to good use. Um, you know, that we have, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. I haven't, but, but thank you for pointing that out. I had, okay. We had no idea it had any sort of okay. intended ice rating. And, and I know nothing more than what I just said, so. I, I appreciate that. I will follow up on that. Hey Sam, Dennis here, and I, you know, hate to have yet another very capable chair stepping out of the position. Uh, you know, your committee seems to me is one of the more uh, complex uh, obligations. You know, because there's so many systems that intersect, whether it's the natural system, the cultural system, the international system, the interagency system. It just goes on and on and on, and you know, there's just so many struggles with those intersections and. Uh, so I really have always admired what you've been able to accomplish. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to talk up the opportunity with your uh, successor. 
yeah. Well, thank thank you, Dennis. Um, yeah, I agree. This is a this is this is what I like about this committee is that you don't know what's coming your way, and and you know, being able to look at the expertise that runs this infrastructure all the way from the people who support the on-ship activities to the to the scheduling to the looking ahead to what we need to stay current and and cutting edge in the world um it's a really nice community so um please pass that along to anybody who might you you think might be a good member for this committee um it's worthwhile all right, thanks, Sam. Great update, great conversations. And again, thanks for your leadership as well in running AICC. It's been a real pleasure working with you during all this time. Um, next up is the Scientific Committee for Oceanographic uh, Aircraft Research, or SCORE. And so Chris Zappa is gonna join us, the new chair of the SCORE Committee. Alice, can I chair Alice? I mean, can I share Alice or no? Go for it. That's the full screen, right? Yep. So that's thank, presenter thanks, view. That's presenter that's, view. That's which one? Uh, we see two slides. Oh, you do? All right. Yeah. Here you go. That one. Go back one. Yep. All right. Oh. So, <clears throat> thanks. No, didn't work. Thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to report on the the score committee's activities for the last year. Um, I am the new chair. Just swapped in just recently for Luke Lenane, who was the past chair for the past five six years. Um, here's our committee membership right now. Myself. So I swapped into the chair and Luke swapped out and we added one member, Armin Sarugian from University of Arizona. And we also have Michael Sterick from Texas A&M Corpus Christi, Britt Stevens from Ankar, Hanu Singh from Northeastern, and Ronnie Avasar from University of Miami Erasmus. And our RV Tech committee rep is Andrew Wugan. <clears throat> and our... I also have an ex officio member, Anthony Buckholtz, who is now the new head of the MPS Research Aircraft Facility, formerly SIRPAS. And typically we have a, a meeting, an annual meeting, um, generally in the summer for a day and a half, but recently we've been holding virtual meetings quarterly. And our last meeting was August 23rd. And if you want to learn more about the committee, here's the, um, the URL for what we're for updates and previous meetings and all the um, presentations at those meetings. So in, as a broad uh, kind of goals of our of SCORE are to inform the broader community of the use of airborne assets in support of ocean scientists, in particular, the coordination with the academic research vessels. And I wanna um, highlight that SCORE is available as a resource to PIs our VTEX and, and anyone who's interested in adding this capability to future UA, uh, future field programs. And we're definitely interested in receiving community input and feedback on implementation. So follow up ex, um, discussions about UAS in general are welcome. Sam just mentioned previously in his, his discussion how complicated it is in the Arctic. It's um, UAVs anywhere is, is a complicated um, endeavor. And so as part of that, our, our ongoing activities are always trying to develop a roadmap for making uh, crude and, or unoccupied UA, uh, aerial vehicles a standard capability on the academic research fleet or more, more routine or um, the norm. So we've developed the UAS Operators Handbook, and I think that's maybe been presented previously, but it's been endorsed by UNALS. And we're always interested in operator user input and feedback to improve this document. And we're always, um, that's one of our goals over the next year is to update it because as Sam pointed out, things are always changing and need to be updated for that. Um, one, uh, there's a lot of um, words, but 
the, the highlighted part of the, the committee, we want to promote collaboration and cooperation between facility operators, the funding agencies, and the scientific community to improve the availability and the capabilities of all aircraft facilities supporting ocean sciences, so both crewed and uncrewed. <clears throat> so to promote these, the use of um, UAVs in support of atmospheric and oceanographic research, we've had a, um, a few town halls at Ocean Sciences um, previously in 2020, and we have an upcoming one in 2022 um, to get community impact or input from the scientific community. Um, as I mentioned, we've developed this operations handbook for working on the US academic research fleet. And we're exploring various approaches to make UAS standard capabilities on the, on the research fleet. And I'll, I'll, we've recently presented at the RV Tech meeting, and I'll, I'll highlight that a little bit later. Andrew Wugan and I um, presented there. So the handbook is designed to provide detailed guidance on how to operate the UAS from the academic research fleet. So it's motivated to develop the UAS policy and guidance documents for shipyard operations. So from, for all scales of UAVs, whether it be small <clears throat> quadcopters to light fixed wing, to catapult systems, to handheld launching systems, to um, other high endurance um, catapult and or, or fixed wing systems, whether they be catapult or um, vertical takeoff and landing. If you're interested in the, so here's the, the handbook. There's the, there's a, it's on our website for the score community. You can find it at the URL below. But in general, it provides a flowchart for decision making. So for use by the science party and our operator institution on how to assist them with safe operations. Um, it also helps to provide a timeline um, when should a when should a PI start planning UAS operations? And it should be well in advance of when you're um, going to see and or even writing your proposals. <clears throat> um, and there's three main sections of planning and preparation, actual shipboard procedures, and then post cruise actions. And there's a number of um, appendices to um, facilitate this. As I mentioned, um, another activity is or we presented at the RV Tech meeting, Andrew Wugan and I, and we just wanted to reach out to, to the RV Techs to invite them to work more closely with SCORE and engage PIs to, to facilitate the use of UAVs on ship to make them more routine um, and safe. Um, <clears throat> we both, I mean, Andrew and I both see the utility, great utility from different perspectives of um, the use of UAVs um, from mine perspective is from a larger high endurance fixed wing vehicle that can fly for eight hours and you can go out and map the ocean for a long period of time and actually extend extend the view or extend the, uh, the purview of the ship. You can go 50 miles away from the ship, find something you're looking for and then come back and bring the ship to where you wanna go, um, where you see your feature. Versus, and, and also even smaller UAVs like quadcopters, where you can have an, a beautiful hover capability where you can sit there and watch any feature on the ocean near the ship. In this case, um, Andrew highlighted, they were looking at um, whales just in the visible and the infrared just off the, uh, and they were able to track it over time. So there's um, great utility in this. And we just wanted to bring that to the interest or the, you know, um, to inspire the RV techs to not, not that it's an added, an added um, um, obligation, but something that was, is really something useful for everybody. And I just wanted to finally <clears throat> highlight that Anthony Buckholtz and the Naval Postgraduate School Searpass Airborne Facility is ongoing um, and the Twin Otter Facility has a number of range of capabilities for measuring um, air interaction and turbulent fluxes. Um, it also has a number of specialized payloads, whether it be this, this towed 
vehicle, which doesn't go into the water, it hovers over the ocean at like at roughly 10 meters to measure air sea fluxes. And it also has um, also a stabilized radiometer platform that Anthony runs. Um, it also has um, drops on capability and um, wind LIDAR our system as well. And they have a number of planned missions in the next year. Actually, one already was completed on the Sea Harrier in October. And they have two more planned for early 2022, um, both off of California, um, Calico, and SWEX. And I will leave it there if there are any questions. I'll try to get through that quickly. Well, thanks, Chris. It was very interesting, uh, a, lot, a lot happening in your end too. Questions for SCORE and, and, or, and or Chris. Okay, well, thanks for stepping up, Chris, taking over uh, leadership of the committee. I know it's the, fall, it's the big shoes to fall, fill there as well, but no, all I hear is you're way up to it. So no, look forward to your leadership on the committee. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, before I go to our last um, um, our last update from RV Tech, I just want to let John Orcutt know there's a question for you in the chat or regarding your discussion about um, outdated uh, OBSs. So if you can take a check, take a look at that. It'd be great, John. Thanks. Uh, finally, uh, Lee Ellett's going to give us an update from RV Tech. Actually, he's not. Jules is. Oh, Jules, what well, even better. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, <Jules. clears throat> I have assumed the mantle of chair as of a week and a half ago. Um, so Alice, skip the first slide and skip to the end. There's only three, skip that one, go to the next one. There we go. Okay, so the meeting that we had this year was virtual, it lasted five days. We had three hours a day of presentations by a variety of subcommittees in late October. Um, the presentation mechanism was um, a, a, an app called uh, Whova. And um, I think this helped a lot in terms of um, Brandy's uh, efforts in trying to keep all the, the cats corralled. There were 199 people who attended and they the, consolidating everything underneath Whova meant that there was access to Zoom, their chat, um, they had community forums posters, social networking, sharing photographs. Um, I, I thought it worked pretty well. Uh, cutting to the chase, um, there is no substitution for person-to-person -person communication. And I believe that the research vessel, of research vessel Technical Enhancement Committee consists of two people, the chair and the chair-elect who we are recruiting for, and 199 research vessel technical enhancement community participants. And so the, the meeting, in-person meeting is, is really, really important. Um, we, uh, in terms of moving forward, the future communications, um, the managers are meeting um, month, uh, monthly, virtually, and there are quarterly uh, meetings. I think this was the, the training. No, I don't, I don't remember whether this came through the training subcommittee or not, but we decided to have a what went wrong Wednesdays. I think we had a um, morale mash Mondays and a terrible Tuesdays and a what went wrong Wednesday. And anyway, we picked Wednesdays. So those are gonna be moderated technical discussions. Um, can you go back by one slide? It would, be, it would be great to articulate every single one of these, the abstract of every single one of these presentations, but I don't think I'm gonna do that. Um, we kicked it off with Mara's presenting on respectful environment at sea and, uh, and set the tone for inclusive um, discussions and uh, civil in, uh, communication. Uh, pools and resources, we had the East and West Coast winch pool, the wire pool, UHDAS uh, reported on ocean current measurements, the uh, potential fields pool equipment, so that's graven gravimeters and magnetometers presented, the new RCRV ships and uh, MARSAM, which is the OSU sediments group. Uh, community instrumentation, we got a pres presentation about Argo. And then Lee um, had a discussion about pingers, mock nests, and PCO2, which each have their own challenges. Uh, in terms of the increasing importance of satellite communications, especially with COVID, we needed to have 
uh, everybody is is intensely relying on their ability to communicate from C. And so there were uh, presentations about how that gets done <clears throat> and upcoming technologies, SATNAG, the Satellite Network Advisory Group reported. And then separately from that, there's a whole new um, concern having to do with cyber infrastructure and cybersecurity. Uh, the Cyber Infrastructure uh, Working Group presented and our engagement with research SOC um, that was uh, also presented. There are upcoming IMO regulations for a ship to even sail. And so this is a, this is a, a big element of importance. Um, the technical training subcommittee reported SCORE, as you just heard, and the MATE internship program, um, which is a big feeder program for the, uh, for the RV tech community. Uh, there were reports on instrumentation. Um, R2R got stuck in there just because we had sort of funny slot <laughs> slot things, but um, instrumentation best practices and uh, the three and there was an, uh, this demonstration of um, three not demonstration but a slideshow about three D printing. Um, the RCRV is using a McGregor Triplex um, launch and recovery system, so we got a uh, an interesting presentation there and learned a lot about um, yeah things I don't know about. It's really fascinating. And Jason ROV has a different launch and recovery system. Um, when you attend the RV Tech uh, meeting, you learn so much about all the other parts of the, uh, all the other things that happen when you're in your place doing the thing that you are so passionate about. And I think that's what's, that's what's so exciting about RV Tech and also the entire UNOLS community is that everybody really brings a lot of energy and passion to this. There were 16 posters. Um, including uh, one about Healy's Northwest Passage Cruise and Oceanus's last year. And then we typically have a Friday technical session um, and uh, Alice presented about the new marine facilities planning. Um, and uh, also John Haverleck presented on a, a IT, IT asset management system that can be installed. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there because <laughs> I'm the last one and I will hold us up if I go on any longer. Thanks, Jules. Thanks for taking the job, Jules. Really appreciate it. Another, you know, we keep saying it, another important committee that you know, have great leadership. Where, where would we be? Where would we be? Jules, it's great to have you lead, leading RV Tech. Thanks, and thanks, many thanks to Lee for his leadership. Um, while managing a wide, a whole wide portfolio with scripts too, so. Well, yeah, I mean, talk about big, big shoes to fill. If I look at everything he does, I have to figure out which part of that is the RV tech chair part and which part is everything else he does. <laughs> yeah, well, we're really lucky to have great passionate people like both of you and, and many others in your community, so thank you. Um, so any questions for Jules about RV tech at all? If not, that concludes all our presentations for today and all our updates. Thanks to all the committees for their updates and all your great work throughout the year. Uh, that is the end of session seven. So Wednesday will be session number eight, our last session for the annual meeting. We'll have our, we'll have our present keynote address from Kendall Moore from URI. We're really looking forward to that. And then we're gonna finish that up with our celebration of 50 years of UNOL. So we, hopefully everybody will join us for that. We're gonna have some folks that have been uh, parts of UNOS throughout the years, uh, sharing some insights, some stories, some, uh, some, some thoughts on how UNOS came about and how it developed into the great organization it is today or coalition that we have, that we've all been talking about the last, uh, last seven sessions. Um, Dennis? Yeah, just a reminder that Doug, that we wanna end next Wednesday with a toast to UNOS on its 50th, right? So everyone has to, BYOB. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> yep. I'm sorry. But that would be that would be fun. Yeah. So we look forward to that. So thanks, Dennis. Yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Take care. We'll see, we'll It'll be really exciting days. on Wednesday. So I encourage everyone to come. Bye bye. Bye 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 everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.